Hi, I'm Hannah Owens. I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Copenhagen. I do a lot of niche modeling, um, mostly to understand biogeography patterns in the context of climate change throughout, throughout evolutionary history. A lot of these studies have been done in terrestrial systems, but um, I also have a lot of background doing niche modeling in marine systems. Today, I will be presenting you the final lecture in the environmental data uh, series of topics associated with the E&M 2020 uh, online course, and we'll be talking about marine data. And I'll start this lecture by sort of outlining um, what is unique about marine data compared to terrestrial data. Uh, we'll then move on to how some of these marine data are collected so you can begin to understand um, some of the outlying features of these data, but also uh, where you might be able to evaluate some uh, potential drawbacks and hopefully get around them. And then finally, I'll talk about some uh, very specific data sets uh, that you might want to use when you're doing your ecological niche models. So to start, uh, I'll offer a little context on marine data. So unlike a terrestrial system, which we can generally consider to be a smooth two-dimensional surface, although we do generally consider elevation in that, uh, the ocean is truly three-dimensional. So in addition to having uh, latitude and longitude coordinates for a particular location, uh, depth is also a very important consideration. And you can see this in this slide, um, which shows some of how the ocean is broken down into different zones. We have the epipelagic zone, which is uh, where most of the sunlight is, the mesopelagic zone or the twilight zone where uh, sunlight gets to be more scarce, the bathypelagic zone, abyssopelagic zone, and hadopelagic zone are all well below uh, the depths at which light can penetrate, which means that these systems can be quite unique from those uh, at the surface. And so if you're thinking about uh, the environmental variables that a particular organism is experiencing at the surface, they may be very, very different than those that uh, organisms in the hadopelagic zone or even the mesopelagic zone experience. Um, in addition to this, the ocean is uh, very highly connected, uh, but also can experience some very uh, unique uh, separations in terms of how uh, different masses of water interact. So this is a slide showing you how this works in Antarctica, uh, that you have these uh, very unique water masses that are determined uh, by the density of the water, also um, exposure to wind at the surface, and then in at, at greater depths you have uh, water that's actually moving independent of those surface waters that has very different characteristics. And finally, at the bottom, at least in the Antarctic, you have the bottom water, which experiences very little intermixing with the rest of the system. And so you can end up with very unique habitats, and in some, which are in some cases very highly connected, or in some cases very isolated, even though they may be in very close proximity to each other. And uh, one final thing I'd like to mention about uh, these ocean systems is that we have to remember that over 80% of the ocean remains unexplored. There are more people that have been to the surface of the moon than have been to the deepest part of the ocean in the Mariana Trench. And this isn't to say that we, uh, that our job as modelers in marine systems is impossible because we do have a lot of different ways of getting data, collating that data, and interpolating that data in a way that is sensible so that we can still get some picture of how uh, organisms and marine systems experience the environments around them. So what can we measure in the ocean? Uh, there are a variety of different variables, so we'll start with ocean color. Um, so basically, uh, what color is the ocean. This can uh, tell us something about sea surface temperature, how much um, radiation is coming off of the ocean. Uh, chlorophyll, if you look at the greenness of the ocean, you can see this as a primary for, or a, nah, you can see that as a proxy for primary productivity. 
you can also look at particulate organic carbon, um, which is mostly calcium carbonate, uh, which is also a primary productivity proxy. And so if chlorophyll is green, uh, particulate or inorganic carbon is actually white. So if you have a very light colored ocean, it may indicate that you have a lot of that calcium carbonate. You can also measure benthic properties, so things like bathymetry. Here we have a bathymetry map of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. Uh, in addition to just bathymetry, so just how deep the ocean is from the surface at a particular point, you can also look at slope, aspect, and concavity, which are all features of uh, how the ocean floor is shaped. So how steep is the slope? You can see off the west coast of Mexico, there's a very deep trench. Uh, aspect, which way a particular slope is facing. Is it facing south? Is it facing north? Is it facing east? Is it facing west? and also concavity. So if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, you have a very concave area off the east coast of Mexico. Whereas if you're looking at the uh, continental shelf off of Florida, which you can see on the other side of the Gulf of Mexico, that has a very convex shape, which can make a big difference when it comes to ocean circulation patterns and uh, how fast water is moving in a particular system. You can also look at sediment properties of the benthic zone. So how thick is the sediment? Is there a big thick layer of mud? Is it bare rock? Uh, the size of the sediment, is it a very fine clay or is it much larger gravel? Um, and also the composition of that sediment, is it mostly silicaceous? Is it uh, high in iron content? Also, for we can measure a lot of characteristics of the water itself, so things like temperature and salinity. The picture shown here is of uh, one daily temperature measurement, um, and you can see that it's not nearly uniform. You have all sorts of swirls and eddies. You have a very warm water mass off of Mexico, and then you have a very cold water mass, or you have a relatively colder water mass coming up from uh, the west coast of South America before it recirculates across the uh, equator. And so you can see how complex these systems might be. We can also measure uh, a bunch of different properties of the gases that are dissolved in the water. So things like dissolved oxygen, the percentage of oxygen saturation, uh, which is rel the, it's a relative measure um, which is more relevant at depth. So how uh, much oxygen is dissolved in water uh, goes up, or in, the amount of oxygen that can be dissolved in water goes up as pressure goes up, which means you can dissolve more oxygen in water the lower you are in the water column. Um, you can also look at apparent oxygen utilization. This is the difference between uh, the concentration at saturation and measured concentration. So how much oxygen is actually being used in a particular area, which may give you, again, some sort of idea about primary productivity uh, and how much biomass is actually in a particular area. You can also measure a bunch of other dissolved chemicals in addition to salts. So silicate, which is a nutrient important for diatoms, like the ones I have shown here on the right. Uh, phosphate, which is a limiting nutrient in marine systems. So if you dump a bunch of phosphate into the system, you're going to get a big algae bloom, whereas if there's less phosphate, there tend to be uh, fewer phytoplankton uh, that fuel this whole system. Um, and then nitrate is another one, which is another important nutrient. It's much more important in terrestrial systems than marine systems generally, but it's still um, an important thing to keep track of when we're trying to understand uh, ocean systems. So how are all of these data collected? The first way, which will probably look familiar based on the previous lectures, is remote sensing. So we can use satellites to measure ocean color, sea surface temperature, and sea level change. You just point the satellite at the Earth and take your pictures. And then you can process that information into ocean color, sea surface temperature, and sea level change data products. You can also use airplanes for remote sensing, um, particularly for laser bathymetry. So this isn't that dissimilar from developing uh, 
terrestrial topology maps. Um, you have a plane with a laser that's pointed at the ocean and you get uh, and then it measures the reflectance of that laser back up to the plane. And of course this is going to be much more useful in uh, shallower waters than it is in deeper waters. Uh, for deeper waters it's actually uh, more reliable to use ship-based sonar bathymetry. So you take a ship and you uh, run transects uh, measuring the distance from the ship to the ocean bottom to map it. You can also take in situ measurements of water using things like buoys. Um, so these buoys can either be anchored um, or they can be free floating. In the buoy shown at the picture on the left here, or in the buoy shown in the picture on the right, you can see that it actually has its own power supply. It's a diesel generator um, and it's floating at around, or, and it can take various measurements at different depths. So in this particular one, it's taking temperature at four meters, six meters, 10 meters, 15 meters, 20 meters on down to the bottom at 35 meters. Um, but it's also taking uh, meteorological measurements, so wind speed, air pressure, air temperature, uh, wind direction. Um, and so it's taking all of these measurements and it can then transmit those measurements to a satellite that collects that data and then sends it back to uh, scientists to process that data. Um, and so in this way, it's not that different than something like a, we a weather station that's taking continuous measurements at a particular point. Um, but then, of course, these data would need to be interpolated so that you get a continuous uh, map of potential sea surface temperature or uh, depth temperatures. Another way of doing this, especially um, as you get into deeper waters, is doing instrument casts. So in this case, you might have a research vessel on a cruise uh, that drops an instrument package like the one in the picture on the right. Uh, and these instrument packages can measure connectivity or conductivity, temperature and pressure uh, in addition to depth. So it's taking constant measurements of the depth as it's dropped down in the water column. Uh, the gray bottles on this particular instrument package are called Nis Niskin bottles and those sample water at depth. So you could say, I want to take a measurement at 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters, and you'll get a water sample at each of those uh, depths that you can then use to interpolate and understand um, these different uh, water characteristics at different depths. Uh, and they often also come with other sensors, including chlorophyll sensors, uh, some of sensors to measure some of those dissolved oxygen uh, features that I talked about, as well as nutrients. Um, and these uh, instrument casts are great because they can actually sample to depths of 10,500 meters, which is pretty deep. Um, and the map shown at the bottom is a concentration of where most of the instrument cast data come from. Uh, in one of the data sets that we'll be talking about later. So you can see that some places are much more uh, widely and, and thoroughly sampled than others. Uh, the further you get from shore and the further you get from large population centers, you have fewer measurements that have been taken. So the North Atlantic is fairly uh, carefully studied. The seas around Japan are fairly carefully studied. But once you get uh, way out into the middle of the South Pacific, uh, the coverage goes down quite a bit. And so you might uh, begin to suspect that some of the measurements that have been taken uh, in those red areas are potentially going to be much higher resolution uh, than those further away into the blue. So as I said, uh, I was I'm going to talk about some useful data sources now and give you a little bit of a tour of that. So the first data source, which is a data source that I use a lot, is the U.S. National Oceanographic Data Center. Um, and this is based at the United States' National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, called NOAA. Uh, they produce a World Ocean Atlas, which is based on instrument casts. So you remember that map I showed you? That's the map for the World Ocean Atlas data set. Uh, this includes both surface and depth data. So you can 
get the surface measurements, but you can also get a series of uh, defined layers. Um, and those, infer those data include temperature, salinity, oxygen, and nutrients. So you remember I mentioned uh, phosphate and nitrogen. Um, and those are interpolated rasters, so it's a nice smooth raster layer that you're used to seeing. Um, and you can get those annually, seasonally, or monthly, as, and from depths at the surface to 5,500 meters, which covers most of the areas that we have good locality information for. Um, so that can be quite helpful. And 2013 is the most recent version. Um, this is updated every few years. So I'm going to take you now to that website just so you can kind of see what the data look like. My computer wants to go. Okay, so here's the data set. You can see, uh, let's look at temperature first. Um, so over here you can define, you can ask for different formats. So what you'll want to do is ask for ASCII probably, unless you know how to process net CDF files, but um, that's another lecture for another day. Uh, you can also specify your um, resolution, five degrees, one degree, or a quarter of a degree. Uh, generally you're going to want to choose the statistical mean of your given data set. And you can actually ask for this in decadal peri periods, so averaged decades, uh, the data from 55 to 64, the data from 65 to 74. Um, so you get these 20 year chunk, or sorry, 10 year chunks, um, which is uh, potentially of use if you're interested in seeing how uh, climate change and uh, variability in oceanographic uh, characters have affected species distributions through time. And now you can see over here the data come as annual, seasonal, and monthly. And uh, there's a nice description of all of this information at the bottom here, and it gives you the file naming conventions here. And so you can go through and download all kinds of data uh, for your marine niche models. So if we go back to the presentation, all right. So next up we have the U.S. National Centers for Environmental Information's eTOPO1 Global Relief Model. So this is a, uh, well, it's both terrestrial and uh, bathymetry, but it's essentially a worldwide um, topography map. So it's an, and it's an aggregation of international data, which is mostly based on sonar. So you remember I mentioned that ship-based sonar, that's uh, what most of these data are. This map at the bottom shows the different data sources. Uh, so you probably heard uh, the SRTM 30 discussed um, in previous lectures for this course. Uh, there's also uh, all of this information available on this Greenland data set. You've got the globe topography. Uh, you've got a specific data set for the Baltic Sea. Uh, and all of these different data sets are then uh, quilted together into this really nice global high resolution uh, data set. And as bathymetry can play a big important role for a lot of different species, uh, this is a very useful data layer. And this is what the website looks like for downloading that data. And you can download it either as a net CDF or as a geo-referenced TIFF if you want. Um, yeah. So going back to the presentation again. Uh, MarsSpec is another useful data set, so that's for uh, modern oceanographic data. Uh, this is the citation for that data set uh, from Ecology. And this is, oh, oh goodness. So this is all processed data, which means they've taken data from a variety of data sources and uh, put it all together into uh, a single uh, data source, which is really nice because it means that all of the data are at the same resolution and the same geographic um, coordinate system. So you don't need to spend as much time trying to massage your data into a common format. 
And these data, actually I said that's modern data, but it also includes uh, past oceanographic climates. And so I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Saup mentioned that last week, but I'm mentioning it again here. Uh, so it incorporates data from the World Ocean Atlas, which is what I showed you, although uh, it's an earlier version of the World Ocean Atlas, as well as NASA's Ocean Color Web. So the uh, US NASA service offers um, a really nice remote sensing uh, data set for ocean color. And PMIP2, which is a paleoclimatology data set um, based on general circulation models. And those data are available at as fine a resolution as 30 arc seconds. So really high resolution data, really nice. Uh, they also offer geophysical data, so bathymetry and sea surface temperature and salinity, uh, as well and several summary stats for those data, just like WorldClim. So if I'll sh I can show you that again, it has a nice website that you can find all of these data collected in one spot. So this is the modern data. Now you can see here we have bathymetry. Uh, there's a variety of uh, geophysical information. So you remember I talked about aspect and curvature, um, as well as distance to shore, uh, bathymetric slope. So how uh, much of a slope is at the ocean floor, concavity I talked about. Um, and then you get uh, sea surface salinity and sea surface temperature summarized, very similar to how the bioclim data are, t are summarized. Although I will note that unlike the World Ocean Atlas data set, these data are only available for the sea surface. So if you're interested in uh, organisms that live in the pelagic zone or at the, at the ocean bottom, um, these may or may not be as helpful. Although often whatever is going on at the surface has a very strong effect on, on, on what's going on uh, at depth. And so you, you may be okay, um, but I would be very careful about uh, the underlying assumptions of doing that. So as I said, this is the modern data set and you can also get the paleo data set here. Uh, and that comes from a variety of different models. So the CCSM model, for example, the MIROC model, uh, and at two different time points. So you can get data from the mid-Holocene, 6,000 years ago, and the last glacial maximum, 21,000 years ago. And these data are available as ESRI grids. Um, yeah, they're all available as ESRI grids. So, and also, helpfully, they have the abstract from the paper that highlighted this data set and the metadata. Same with the uh, previous uh, data set. Yeah, so right now they have GeoTIFF and KMZ listed, but these are not actually, uh, these actually have not been added yet. You can only get the ESRI grids. Okay. So next up we have BioOracle, which is another processed data set. So everything is all nicely lined up. Um, and here's the citation for that data set. It's a global environmental data set for marine species distribution modeling. Hey, just what we want, right? Um, and this is available at present and future projections. Uh, remember the MarSpec data set is for present and past projections. There is no uh, one marine data set that I'm aware of yet that does both past, present, or does all three past, present, and future projections. So um, you may need to flip in between them if you're interested in both the past and the future. Um, but this will get you most of the way there. So again, it's based on the World Ocean Database 2009, so that's the same uh, data set as MarSpec. NASA's Ocean Color Web, which is the same data set as, as another one of the same data sets as MarSpec. But then the CMIP5 uh, data set, which is a set of future climatologies as opposed to what we saw with the paleoclimatologies. So that's CMIP5. And it's available at a five arc minute resolution. And another nice thing about BioOracle is that it includes both surface and bottom variables. And you can get temperature, salinity, nutrients, and dissolved oxygen. So let's take a look at what that looks like. 
So here you see you can choose whether you want present, uh, future that ends at 2050, or future that ends at 2100. You can choose surface or benthic layers, and then you can choose whether it's an ASCII or a GeoTIFF, and then you have all of these available um, measurements. Temperature, salinity, current velocity, ice thickness, which is a nice one if you're working with uh, temperate or arctic species. Sea ice concentration is another good one. Uh, nitrate, phosphate, silicate, these all look familiar. Um, and so you can see this is another really nice, very useful, uh, fairly diverse data set with fairly good coverage. And it's integrated with R. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend you check out this website and see how that works. As I said, also available in R. The package is called SDM Predictors. So if you're interested, you can explore that package. There are also some useful shape files uh, from the Flanders Marine Institute that you might want to use when you're processing your data in order to uh, get a um, more reasonable study area based on some sort of biogeographic hypothesis. Um, so you can choose to clip your layers by water body. Uh, you can also download shape files for ecological classifications, including large marine ecosystems, Longhurst provinces, and fishing zones. So if you're interested in particular fishing zones or anything like that, you can download all the shape files from the Flanders Marine Institute uh, and then process those data. So let's take a quick look there. And so here is that website and then you can go to downloads and these are all of the available downloads. So say I wanted uh, Longhurst provinces which are biogeographic uh, provinces. So you can look at more info to see what those provinces look like. Um, and it will explain much more about the data set there. So you have really nice metadata associated with all of these, uh, all, with all of the Flanders Marine Institute data. Okay. And so that's the end of the uh, overview of marine environmental data. Thanks for uh, listening to me. And if you have any questions, be sure to get those to town and uh, I'll hopefully be able to answer them or at least point you in the direction of an answer. Thank you.